a pleasure and a privilege to be able to bring this word to you today. The word that I believe that God has put on my heart to share with you is on the subject of the blood, the power of the blood. Uh, we can have the first, maybe the first slide. The, the presentation is on there. Um, I have just the title slide now. It's not the first time I've preached on this particular subject. I have preached once or twice before, and it is a it's a big subject. There is so much that you could say on this topic um, that it's quite difficult to kind of within the space of maybe 25, 30 minutes absolute maximum um, to present this, this topic clearly and, and give it what it deserves really as it's such a rich subject. Um, but I pray hard about what what specifically God wants me to bring to you today in this, in this uh, sermon. And I'm going to try to bring you just some, a few clear truths, simple truths, that I want you to take away today. I, I pray that everyone receives something. Many of the things I'm sure many of you would have heard before. But let us not take this subject lightly. You know, there's a difference between knowing things up here and knowing things here. And sometimes the simple truths, many of the things I'm going to say today, I'm sure won't be new to many of you. But, as I say, there's a difference between knowing here and here. There's a process. And, and some of these things, myself, I know that I'm still in the process of getting it from here to here. Because even when we know something, it's not easy always to live it out in our daily lives, to walk in the power and the reality of that truth. Um, but, oh, oh. so it's, it's not, 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 before, before we go any further, I just want to take us back to Exodus chapter 12. Oh, you can go to the next slide. Exodus chapter 12, we won't read it all for the sake of time. We don't need to turn to it either. But I'm sure most of us are familiar with the story of the Passover. The time when God instructed the Israelites to eat one final meal together in their homes before they were to flee Egypt and slavery. Remember, it's the time of the plagues. And this was before the, last, the final plague, the plague of the death of the firstborn, when God was going to finally stop in Pharaoh's heart and allow the Egyptians, the, the Israelites, to leave Egypt and to leave slavery forever. And God instructed the Israelites to eat one final meal in their homes. And it was to be a roasted, roasted lamb. They were to kill a lamb and to roast it and eat it along with bitter herbs and bread without yeast. But they were also told to spread blood from the lamb that they'd killed on the doorposts of the home. And that's what you can see here. So it's a little bit smaller than it should be. But you can see them spreading the blood on the doorposts and the frames of their home. And God told them to do that so that the angel of death would pass over their homes and spare the children. What does that remind you of? Go to the next slide. Jesus, crucified, bleeding on the wooden cross. The Passover and the spreading of the blood on the doorposts of their homes is a powerful image and foreshadowing of Jesus. I believe that in reality the picture was far more gruesome than that picture conveys. You can't actually see it very clearly, but I, 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 didn't, I didn't want to choose a particularly gruesome picture. I don't want to offend any sensibilities here. But anyone who's seen The Passion of the Christ yeah. will 
know how horrific a death it was. Some people say that maybe that was exaggerated. But if you look at accounts of history of what Roman torture was like, I believe that what was portrayed in the Passion of the Christ probably isn't that far from what Jesus actually endured. And if we just go to the next slide, just to give one or two details. On Jesus' head was placed a crown of thorns. Those thorns were probably several inches long and they would be pressed down into his scalp, into his head, causing his head to bleed. The nails that were hammered through his hands and his feet were probably anywhere between four and nine inches long. In fact, Jesus bled seven times. If we go to the next slide, just quickly look at them. First of all, in the Garden of Gethsemane, which was the night before he was betrayed and arrested, which led to his final crucifixion. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweated drops of blood. We're told that in Luke chapter 22, verse 44. I don't understand this, but apparently there is a phenomenon, according to scientists, where it is possible in, in uh, times of extreme stress to sweat blood. Apparently it is a fact that it is possible. Secondly, Jesus was flogged, and we're told that in John chapter 19, verse 1. I don't have a picture of the instrument, but quite likely it was a whip made of pieces of leather, and in that leather uh, were probably little bits of some sort of metal, whatever metal they had in those days, or bone, which would catch into the skin and rip the skin, leaving big scars, big wounds, open wounds on Jesus' back. Thirdly, he was bruised and beaten. We read that in Matthew chapter 26, verse 67. You know what bruising is? Bleeding under the stuff, under the skin. So Jesus was also bleeding internally as well as externally. I've already mentioned the crown of thorns was placed upon his head, surrounding his head with the thorns piercing his skin, and the nails which were driven through his hands and feet. And finally, a spear was uh, pierced through his side to see if he was really dead. And apparently it's a sign of, that someone is dead when, when, the, when blood and water flow out, and that is what happened to Jesus. So his side was also pierced, and blood flowed from it. It's interesting, I only discovered this yesterday, that in the Old Testament, the high priest who entered the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, which was, uh, I haven't got time to go into all this history, but a holy day, that's the, the holiest day in the Jewish calendar, when the high priest would go in and offer sacrifice, and it was symbolic of, of um, Israel being reconciled to God and being in the presence of God once more. And the priest was to, he sprinkled the blood of the ram seven times on the atonement cover. And I, I hadn't picked that up before, but you can actually read it. Um, in, I believe it's Leviticus, I haven't got the, uh, the, the reference down there. Yet another powerful foreshadowing of Jesus. And we know that seven is the number of perfection. It was, Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. But just going back to Passover again, if we go to the next slide, that, that slide is. Yes. Um, where the Israelites spread the blood on the doorpost. I just want to ask you a question. Think about this. Why, actually, why did they need to do that? Did the angel of death not know which were the Israelite houses and which were the Egyptian houses? Could he have not known which families to spare? Why did they actually have to physically put the blood outside their homes as a visible Sign. I believe there's a lesson for us there. The Israelites had to apply the blood 
in order to protect their homes and their families. It was an act of faith <coughs> in obedience to God's word. And I believe in the same way, we need to apply the blood of Jesus in our lives. Amen. Jesus dies, or died, for everyone. Yet only those who believe and confess their faith in him receive forgiveness and all the benefits of his sacrifice. So how do we apply the blood of Jesus? Well, put very simply, I believe that is simply to acknowledge what the blood has done for us. We declare it and we thank God for it. Obviously, taking communion, which we're going to do shortly, is one way of doing that. But I believe even daily we can, by the words of our mouths, by our declarations, by our thanksgiving to God, we can be applying that blood. We can be applying it on a daily basis. Amen. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, unlike the sacrifices in the Old Testament, which had to be done over and over again, Jesus' sacrifice was once and for all. Yet, we need to continue applying it that blood on a daily basis. So, if we're going to do that, we need to know what the blood of Jesus has accomplished for us. And again, as I say, many of these things I know won't be new to many of you, but we can never hear it too often, I believe. So the first thing that Jesus, in fact, I've linked some things together for the sake of time here, um, but the next slide. He, the blood of Jesus has set us free from sin and death. Now for each one of these there are many, many scripture references I could give you, but I've just chosen a few to hone in. I've linked sin and death together because as we know it tells us in Romans chapter 6 verse 23 that the wages of sin is death. So the consequence of sin was death. But Jesus set us free from the law of sin and death. Romans chapter 8 verse 2 says the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. John chapter 1 verse 29 says the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God as we know is Jesus, again another foreshadowing, it was the lamb, it was a lamb that was killed for the Passover. It was the Lamb's blood that was shed. Jesus is known as the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1 to 2, it says that we died to sin. And Titus chapter 2, verse 12, so says that we have the power to say no to ungodliness in our lives. You know what, another interesting little fact, I, I did bring this up last time I, I, I preached, I believe. But in the book of Leviticus, again, we, we're reading about the Old Testament rituals where God gave instructions to Moses regarding the ceremonial anointing of the high priest. And Moses was instructed to put blood from a ram on the right ear, the thumb of the right hand, and the big toe of the right foot. Now, it seems a, a rather strange thing to do. Why those specific parts of the body? I used to believe that it kind of represented the extremities of the body and, uh, and demonstrated that it covers everything, which I believe is partly true. Um, but I read in Joyce Meyer, uh, Joyce Meyer said it was the ear so the priest would hear clearly and not be deceived, the thumb so that whatever he put his hand to would be blessed, and the foot so that wherever he stepped would be holy and sanctified. But also what she said, and this is what I found particularly interesting, was that the right side was known to symbolise power. Demonstrating that it's only the blood that releases this power in our lives. Uh, good. Okay, so the blood of Jesus sets us free from sin and death. Sets us free from sickness. The next one. Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, which is the prophecy about the suffering servant, the prophecy of Jesus' death on the cross, it tells us by his stripes, the wounds on his back, we are healed. We know from reading the gospel accounts 
But Jesus healed the sick, he raised the dead. And in Matthew chapter 14, verse 36, it says that all who touched him were healed. Interesting, all who touched him. Not necessarily everyone. Those who touched him, those who reached out to him. Those who were willing to receive it. Those who were willing to apply it. The power that he has. It's not automatic. We have a part in receiving. The Israelites in the wilderness, again going back to the Old Testament, there were three million Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years. And we're told in scripture, scripture that there was no sickness among them. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 15 to 16, Moses tells the people, the Lord will keep you free from every disease. Amen. Are we claiming that for our lives? Because I believe, by the blood of Jesus, that can be true for us as well. Amen. And I'm going to start speaking that over my life. I know Brother Evangel already does it. Let's be encouraged by this. Sickness and disease is not our portion. Shame and guilt, the next one. Psalm 34 verse 5 says that those who look to him, those who look to Jesus, are radiant. Their faces never covered with shame. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says, Jesus bore the shame of the cross to take away our shame. You know that the origin of shame was in Genesis chapter 3 to 4. That was when shame and guilt entered the world. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 25, Adam and Eve were naked and they felt no shame. But after they ate of the apple, the tree of knowledge, good and, good and evil, they realised that they were naked. They felt shame and they made coverings to, to hide themselves. You see the progression there. Sin leads to shame, it leads to guilt, and it leads to fear because they were then fearful. They were fearful of God. But on the cross, God restored to us the original <coughs> plan. The original plan was for eternal life. Amen. For a sinless life. For perfect health. That was God's original plan. Right. And when Jesus died on the cross, he gave us a way to be returned to that original plan. That's why sometimes Jesus is known as the second Adam. <coughs> Romans chapter 8 verse 1. Possibly one of my favourite scriptures. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Maybe some of you need to hear that this morning. There's no condemnation. Whatever, whatever you've done, you come to Jesus, say, I'm sorry. There is no condemnation. The guilt and the shame is taken away. Fear and anxiety are the last two, which is another cut very briefly. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 tells us that God's perfect love drives out fear. In Psalm 34, verse 4, David says, He delivered me from all my fear. Not just some of them. He delivered me from all my fears. And if that was King David living in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant, how much more should we, as New Covenant believers, Filled with the Holy Spirit, be delivered from fear. Amen. Scripture tells us repeatedly, do not fear, do not worry, do not be anxious. In John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. 
Jesus faced fear and anxiety in Gethsemane the night before his arrest. Remember, that was when he, was drop, when he sweated the drops of blood. And then he was mocked, he was insulted, he was rejected. He can identify with every negative emotion that you and I can go through. Yet he was victorious. And because of him, we can be victorious too. Amen. Jesus can heal us not only from physical sickness, I believe, but mental sickness too. And that is demonstrating, I believe, by the crown of thorns. Jesus bled from here too. So even mental sickness is under the blood of Jesus. Guilt, shame, fear, anxiety are the root of many mental health problems today. But the blood of Jesus has the power to heal all of it. Do you believe it? Amen. Do you believe it? So, the great exchange, the next slide, for, for sin, instead of sin, he's taken away our sin, Jesus, by his blood, has given us holiness and righteousness. And for those that don't know what righteousness means, it basically means right standing with God. Instead of death, he's given us eternal life. Instead of shame and guilt, he's given us honour, glory and a clear conscience. Amen. Instead of fear, he's given us faith. And instead of anxiety, he's given us peace. And something else I just wanted to highlight, especially as uh, following the service we're going to a time of prayer. James chapter 5 verse 16 says, The prayer, and I think this is line for it, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Who is righteous? We are. We are righteous. We are righteous because of the blood of Jesus. So if we are righteous, that is us too. And our prayers are powerful and effective. Do you believe that? That your prayers are powerful and effective? Okay, we're going to transition towards having a time of communion now. But there are just a few things I want to say relating to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Got the next slide up. Got the scripture up there. It says, A man ought to examine himself before he eats of bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognising the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. Now, I just want to encourage us. When we come forward to take communion, we come with reverence, remembering what the blood has done for us. In the past, we used to say that only those who have been baptised could take communion. We, in recent years, we've been allowing anyone who wants to come, to come and take communion. If you believe, if you love Jesus. Yeah. So you don't necessarily have to wait for baptism, and even children, pre-being baptised, have sometimes come and taken communion. We don't want to stop anyone from taking communion. Jesus said, Let, don't hinder the little children from coming through. We're not going to stop anyone from coming. But what we would like to say is it is important that you understand the significance of what you're doing. So parents, if your children want to take communion, and maybe they haven't yet been baptised, just have a talk with them. Make sure they understand, albeit in simple terms, but understand what it is they're doing, what is the significance of the bread and the wine. Because this isn't just some religious ritual. It's a powerful and meaningful act of remembrance and commitment. 
And in this scripture that I just read, we have a warning about the consequences of taking his meal lightly. It says that many among the, the Corinthian congregation were weak and sick, and he's he's actually equated to the fact that they have they've been taking the communion, not taking it seriously, taking it lightly, not really recognizing the solemnity of what it is and what it means. But the converse side of that also should encourage us that if we do understand what we're doing and we take it seriously, we can be strong and healthy. Amen. And Matthew chapter 5, the next scripture, just the other scripture I just wanted to read. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 to 24, it says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. And I believe we can, or we should, follow a similar principle when it comes to the communion table. In the first scripture that I read, it says that we should examine ourselves. Let us do so. And if there is a problem with offence or unforgiveness, some relationship issue that needs to be resolved, do your best to deal with it. It may just be that you can repent before God, bring it to God. But if you sense the Holy Spirit telling you you need to resolve this first, do it. Refrain from taking communion on this occasion. Deal with the conflict or whatever it is and take communion next time or in your own home. You don't need to wait to have communion here. We can take communion on our own home. I know Pastor Evangel does it every day. Don't be embarrassed or ashamed if you feel the Holy Spirit is prompting you for whatever reason not to come forward. And I'm not saying it's not be, nothing to do with us not being worthy. It's not that at all. It's none of us in that respect. But there is no shame. There is no guilt, as I've already said. There is no condemnation. Do as you believe the Holy Spirit is leading you. And if you if you do need to speak to someone about some sort of issue, some unforgiveness or whatever, just do it wisely. I remember a story uh, a time many years back when um, I had a lodger, and she came to me one morning and she said, "I just wanted to let you know that I forgive you." Oh. Um, what did I need to be forgiven? I didn't even know what, what the issue was. So it kind of, I didn't have a problem before then, but just her saying, I've forgiven you, it's like, okay, what was our problem? Um, so just be wise. Uh, it's important to know what the issue is and to communicate. You know, and, and it works the other way as well. Rebecca and I have been watching The Chosen, and there's an episode in there where Simon Peter. Um, and his wife, Eden, aren't talking with each other. And Simon Peter doesn't actually know what the problem is. And, and he's advised by someone, and he takes this advice, and he just goes, he just says to his wife one day, and he says, whatever it is, whatever I've done, you're right, and I'm sorry. <laughs> it didn't help the situation. No, it wouldn't. <laughs> so we need to know what we're, what we're being forgiven for, and what is being forgiven. 